introduce uh, the effect of empirical left atrial appendage isolation on long-term procedural outcomes in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation undergoing catheter ablation. These are the results of the BELIEVE trial. Luigi Di Biase from New York, U.S. will present us these results. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Altman, Dr. Brugada, on behalf of the Dr. Natale, the principal investigator and the co-authors, co I would like to uh, uh, present uh, some summary slide of our trial called BELIEF. Uh, these are my disclosure. As you know, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation is uh, the most challenging type of atrial fibrillation to treat with catheter ablation. And several studies have shown that in addition to pulmonary vein, other non-PV triggers area may be the source of initiation and maintenance of atrial fibrillation. And the most common are the superior vena cava, the ligament of Marshall, the coronary sinus, the crista terminalis, the left atrial and posterior wall, and the left atrial appendage. In 2010, we reported this left atrial appendage as a, an under-recognized trigger site of atrial fibrillation in a non-randomized series. Uh, others, uh, other series followed our uh, study where the left atrial appendage, either with surgical removal of the appendage or with ablation, has been reported as an important source of uh, atrial fibrillation. Therefore, we sought to assess whether in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, the empirical electrical isolation of the left atrial appendage, in addition to extensive PV antrum and trigger ablation, could improve freedom from atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardia, at follow-up in a multicenter randomized trial. So this was a randomized parallel group trial where 173 patients were empirically enrolled, were enrolled and randomly assigned to extensive ablation with the empirical appendage isolation versus an extended ablation without the appendage isolation unless a demonstrating firing with sustained arrhythmia was found. This is the study design, 173 patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, being in atrial fibrillation for a consecutive year at least, randomized to extensive ablation of the pulmonary vein, the posterior wall, and uh, non-PV trigger as disclosed by high dose of isoproterenol versus plus the empirical isolation of the appendage versus the ablation of all these structures alone, follow up, at repeat procedure, a second procedure was allowed, or more than one, two procedures were allowed. In all this repeat procedure, the isolation of the appendage was performed. So let's go to the uh, results. This is the kaplan meyer curve single procedure success rate. At the 12 month follow up, 15% of the patient where the empirical isolation of the appendage was performed versus 28% where the appendage was not target empirically. When this, we went to overall 1.3 procedures, the cumulative success rate went up to 76% in the empirical isolation appendage group versus 56% in the other group of antiarrhythmic drugs. Importantly, in the repeat procedures, all the patient underwent appendage uh, isolation. Uh, after adjusting these results, of course, the appendage isolation was a predictor of success. Importantly, it's this slide where what happened to the functionality of the appendage. In 52% of the cases, there was an impaired function with the inconsistent A wave, a low flow velocity, or the combination. And another important slide is that there was no major difference in the hospitalization for recurrent arrhythmias or heart failure. Why this? Uh, I think this slide explains why. This is my last slide, because we believe that in paroxysmal patients, the relevance of the PV trigger is it's more relevant than in long standing persistence. When the AF progress, the relevance of the pulmonary vein goes down and the relevance of a other area, and especially the appendage, is relevant to achieve freedom from arrhythmias at follow-up. And this is what Cox and Mays were doing in the year of surgical ablation of this patient where all the appendage were removed. 
So in conclusion, the results of this randomized study show that both after a single and reduced procedures in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, the empirical isolation of the left atrial appendage improved the long-term freedom from atrial arrhythmias without increasing the number of complications. Future studies examining the physiopathology of these findings are, of course, necessary. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. DiBiase. So we have uh, time now for some questions from the audience, please. Uh, Lynn Peterson with Trends in Medicine. So this is an alternative then to um, something like Watchman? Uh, absolutely not. Actually, it uh, may be a reason to implant maybe more closure device because we are trying to reach sinus rhythm at follow-up. And uh, we do this with an electrical isolation of the appendage. At follow-up, of course, we need to evaluate if there is any contractility in the appendage. And if these appendage are not contracting properly, this patient, to get out of long-term anticoagulation, may still need a, a closure device, such as the watchman, to avoid long-term anticoagulation. It's important to note that patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation usually have high charts and also are, have to be on long-term anticoagulation anyway. So the relevance of this study is, is there a way that I can reach sinus rhythm in a higher number of patients in this very difficult patient population, which is long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation? So you would do Watchman, and then if that wasn't 100% successful, you'd do this, or vice versa? We, we, uh, Watchman is uh, something that applied to discontinuation of oral anticoagulation. This is not the aim of the study. The aim of the study is you have atrial fibrillation, you want sinus rhythm. And this is what the study shows. To achieve sinus rhythm, you need to isolate the appendage. What to do in terms of anticoagulation? Then you can choose to stay on oral anticoagulation and put a closure device. The two things, they don't go together. Please. Wait, one second, one second. One second. Mitchell, Take the mic. Mitchell, Mitchell Zola, Cardiology News. Could you briefly tell us the how you go about doing this isolation? How much time does it add to the overall procedure? And so it sounded like you don't consider this to be the standard of care yet. So what more do you think is needed before it would become standard treatment for these patients? Uh, well, this uh, there was no statistical difference in... Uh, uh, procedural time, of, of, of course, it was longer in the, the uh, arm where the appendage was isolated, and uh, a little bit of radio frequency time was higher in the group where the appendage isolation was uh, uh, added uh, uh, as a, a substrate for uh, ablation. Uh, it takes, I would say, 15 to 20 minutes longer every procedure. Uh, the appendage is isolated, is isolated as a pulmonary veins, so the circular mapping catheter is at the base of the appendage as for pulmonary vein. With the use of intracardiac echo, we go and is electrical isolate uh, the appendage. Well, in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, there is no standard of care. The standard of care of ablation of atrial fibrillation in general is pulmonary vein plus. We do not know there is no standard of care. We do believe this should be standard of care in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. So are you using a balloon, or is it a No, we, use, uh, point, we have used point-by-point point radiofrequency energy. There are no data about isolating the appendage with balloon as of now. Uh, Luigi, the, I have one brief question for you. So um, the very interesting results that you've shown us is by the additional electrical ablation that you're doing, you're improving the likelihood that the patient will not have a recurrence of atrial fibrillation compared to pulmonary vein isolation alone. But it is not 100% uh, arrhythmia free. Yes. So the question which I think I asked you in Rome <laughs> uh, is the oral anticoagulation. So with the follow-up procedure, you're at 76% at about a year or so in follow-up. Um, are you prepared to stop oral anticoagulation in these patients, and how would you decide who you could do it in? Perfect. Very nice question. So the first answer is, as per uh, the European Society of Cardiology guidelines and the American guidelines, when a patient has a child uh, VASC more than two, you are not supposed to 
to discontinue oral anticoagulation. This patient, 50% of them had the child more than two, so irrespective of they were undergoing an ablation or not, they had to be on anticoagulation even without the, the electrical isolation of the appendage. Uh, in addition to this, it's routinely uh, in, the, in the study, actually I had no time to present it, we perform a TE at six months follow-up and we evaluate the contractility of the appendage by his flow velocity and by the uh, consistent A wave for each uh, beat in the mitral inflow. And if the appendage is contracting within normal range and the patient is in sinus rhythm, we extend the monitoring uh, a little bit longer. If the patient stays in sinus rhythm, we are able to discontinue oral uh, anticoagulation. Although it's important question to, to say that these are patients that do not come to the EP table because they have to discontinue anticoagulation. These are patients that come to the EP table because they benefit from sinus rhythm. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll move ahead to the next presentation. Yes, thank you.